So as Michael began with last week, quoting from Fleming Rutledge, that Advent begins in the dark. Advent is the just a Latin word that means, or a word that's used to say it's a, it's a coming or something like that. It's um, an expectation of Christ's coming. So Advent begins in the dark. So it's the notion that to really understand darkness, one must be really aware of that darkness around. One must be aware of darkness within. Isaiah, the Old Testament prophet, says in chapter 9 that the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwell in a land of deep, of deep darkness, on them light has shone. And from this light is born a child, Isaiah says, a son. And the government shall be upon his shoulders. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. And on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness. From this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. So Isaiah wrote and prophesied this before Israel. So Israel at the time is the northern kingdom and Judah, the southern kingdom. He, he prophesied this before they would fall to the Assyrians and Babylonians, before they would go into exile. This is what Isaiah 8 says. They will pass through the land greatly distressed and hungry. And when they are hungry, they will be enraged and will speak con contemptuously against their king and, and their God and turn their faces upward. And they will look to the earth, but behold, distress and darkness, the gloom of anguish, and they will be thrust into thick darkness. But there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. So despite the impending judgment and death, there's hope. There's a hope for the people of God. Right, 700 years after Isaiah's prophecy, a group of shepherds receive this good news. They receive this gospel. But a savior has been born, to which the shepherds replied, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among those whom he is pleased. So you see, out of the darkness shines forth hope. Not arbitrary hope, but hope found in the peaceful reign of Christ. So we'll look at two big things, hope and then peace. So first, hope. Hope at a very basic level is something that we want, something that we want to happen, right? I hope I get that present for Christmas. I hope I get that promotion. I hope I get that apartment. I hope I get that job. I hope I get married and have kids one day. I hope that person goes out with me on a date. I hope my team wins. I'm hopeful that this coming year will be fruitful, right? You can't be sure of it. But that doesn't detract from your longing, right? You, here's what the Apostle Paul writes about hope. Romans 8, he says, Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. So this is the essence of Advent. That we're waiting with patience for the coming of Christ in hope. Paul gives another example, but regarding the antithesis, hopelessness. First uh, Thessalonians, he says, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as those who have no hope. The writer of Hebrews writes that faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Now, you don't hope for something that you know is going to happen or you know you're going to get, right? That's not hope. But we, we definitely use hope flippantly, right, as I just kind of used examples there. But there is, of course, a real hope and a real hopelessness that we all experience on a daily basis or we see around us. I take Paul's example again in Thessalonians. He's not saying don't grieve. He's not saying don't get sad if a loved one passes away. He's saying don't grieve like those without hope. In other words, if you know you're going to see your loved one again in eternity... It, it, sorry, if, if you know you're never going to see your loved one again, 
after they pass. Like, wouldn't that would wreck you, right? I mean, you know that I'm separated forever from that person. And I think um, a modern kind of day example of this type of hopelessness that I see, at least, is um, is in the kind of environmental movement. And I'm all for supporting the environment, so we'll just say that first. But there's there's a you've heard the saying like no planet B, right? This this is our only planet. There's no planet after this. So if this one melts, then we're we're done. There's just there's a sense of despair and and gloom that that if the world takes its course that if you know the environment continues the way it does that we're all we're all done like there's there's nothing beyond that and this is this is our only chance to make sure that the world isn't destroyed in 50 years because of global warming like that is that is hopeless i mean that is a a type of despair that um would 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 wreck you i mean it it it, it totally torments people but what if there, but what if there is another Earth after, right? Like, what if this Earth that we have isn't the only thing? How would that change your response? How would that change the way that you live, despite the fact that maybe it, it seems like the world is going away, right? So you, you, hope is, is the longing that there's something better. And there's, and there's a lot of things that we can hope for. I think... Uh, Peace is certainly one of those things. So into our second point. Peace, a biblical word for peace, you've probably heard this, shalom. And um, there are many expressions of it, right? We have um, the peace sign, there's the hippie movement in the 60s, maybe you think of peace that way, um, or various Christmas decorations that tend to be put around. Or sometimes there's bumper stickers that are like, you know, peace, love, and that there's a, you know, peace, love, and enter restaurant, whatever it is. Um, and we even as a church, of course, just did this. We just extended the peace of Christ with each other, right? We, if there a handshake, or if there a hug, that sort of thing. And maybe it's like good vibes. Maybe that's what you think of peace as. Yeah, we just need to have peace, you know, just good vibes, everyone. But I think all of us at least view peace as the absence of war, or as the absence of fighting, or the absence of contention. At the very least, I think we all think of peace that way. In 1939, at the height of the Nazi regime and on the verge of the Second World War, the first World Trade Center was created, if you didn't know that. At the time, it was just a small pavilion at the World's Fair over in Flushing. And the idea came about by a group of businessmen and traders with the idea to promote world peace through world trade. The World Trade Center, as we know, was eventually moved to lower Manhattan. That small pavilion became the world-renowned Twin Towers, designed by Minoru Yamasaki. And here's what Yamasaki, Seattle-born native, wrote regarding the World Trade Center at its inauguration on April 4th, 1973. This is what he says. The World Trade Center is a living symbol of man's dedication to world peace a representation of man's belief in humanity, his need for individual dignity, his beliefs in the cooperation of men, and through cooperation, his ability to find greatness. So for the next 21 years, the Twin Towers would represent world peace through world trade, even despite the 1993 bombing. But on September 11, 2001, as we know, all hope seemed lost. The once glorious symbols of world peace through world trade would be reduced to ashes. Gloom, darkness, and the stench of death would be filled, would fill this once bustling streets. All right, and then the United States was then plunged into another war. Was world trade the answer? Is there hope? Was there hope for a peaceful world? Is there hope for a peaceful life? His, history tells us that the U.S. is not the only world superpower to be attacked. Pax Romana, the Latin phrase meaning Roman peace, characterized much of Rome's um, history. Their, 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 it, it was their relative peace that they had in the empire. And they were able to secure this for hundreds of years, yet even that came to an end. There's not a single nation on earth that has experienced total peace. Attack is always imminent. That may be from outside or from within. 
despite the fact that the United States even is as powerful, secure, and wealthy as it is, it has still allowed for attack and threat against certain peoples who throughout American history have felt no peace at all, even in their own homeland. Even though Pax Romana was in effect, even for the time of Jesus' birth, Jews were still under Roman military and economic rule. They didn't have the total peace that they expected. But biblical peace is not just the absence of war. It's far more comprehensive. It affects all of life. It's the notion of wholeness, completeness. And that's literally what that word shalom means. It's, it's the idea of completeness, to bring something, to make something whole. When the temple was built and finished, the last little piece that was put into it um, by Solomon was shalom. It was completeness. It was bringing whole. So there's lots of different you know, examples of, of this in the Bible. But it's not just don't fight. It's more whole life. It's more comprehensive. Right? Maybe you think of a time when your life was just working out, or maybe that's where you're at right now. Everything was just firing on all cylinders, as it were. And maybe you're experiencing that or have just experienced that. But somewhere along the way, that peace is interrupted. Right? That relationship now has contention. That job is now frustrating and stressful, and now you want to quit. That apartment now has leaks and mice or loud neighbors. Right? That health condition has suddenly returned. That struggle or temptation has now resurfaced. That credit card is continually maxed out, and your bank account continually zero. Right? Their perfect night out is ruined by another's misbehavior. So peace, shalom, would then restore what was lost. It would make all of those things right. Someone sideswipes your car, shalom would be for them to pay for the damages. And, um, Zadie just got a check in the mail from her, hopefully this is okay for me to use this, from her employer, that they underpaid her. And so they're paying her back for it. That is shalom. That's, that's, that's her employer making right with her. It's making something right. It's making something the way it ought to be. But this also implies that there's a cost to it, right? But you can't just stop fighting and everything will be okay. Both sides have to concede. And at least one side has to absorb the cost. They must let go of something. And there are you know, different types of peace. We have inner peace and relational peace. But I just want to focus on two different or two, two main kinds of peace. Vertical peace, so peace we have with God, and then kind of horizontal peace, so peace we have with each other and peace we have with the world around us. But, let me say this, in order to truly have horizontal peace, we need vertical peace. We need peace with God. The peace with God was broken in the garden where Adam and Eve sinned against God, plunging all of humanity into despair, death, fighting, chaos, and violence. Right? Adam and Eve were expelled from the peace of the garden into a desolate wasteland full of toil. Right? There was nothing in the way of their relationship with God. They had no drama with God. There was no fighting. Their relationship was in sinless, sinless harmony. Everything was good. Everything was good in the garden. No problems. But not just with God, but with each other and with creation. You didn't have animals that were a threat to them, right? Like you didn't, the world wasn't in, in, in brokenness. Everything was in working in perfect harmony. Of course, we know that that didn't last. The first sin of mankind recorded in the Bible is against God. Adam and Eve's disobedience to God. But then the second is between mankind. Cain and Abel, right? As the Bible shows, humanity goes into a downward spiral as it breaks peace with God. And this downward spiral is evident in extra-biblical accounts. We don't need the Bible to tell us this either. Nation against nation, people against people, brother against brother, 
Because we see even though a lot of the Roman emperors would try and would kill each other just to take the place, to take the next throne. Kings have done this throughout history. No nation on earth is sinless. No nation on earth is completely free of this. But God promised to rectify this broken peace, to bring shalom, as it were. He promises through Abraham, right, that through Abraham's children, all of the nations of the earth shall be blessed, is what Genesis says. And bringing up a chosen people, that is Israel, God establishes a holy nation. If Israel was obedient to God, they would have peace. They would have shalom. But if they disobeyed, they would experience a loss of that peace. Right? And Israel saw glimpses of this peace we see in the Old Testament. Yet Israel's disobedience to God ultimately forced them into exile. Isaiah's prophecy that I read at the beginning, it preceded that exile. And this proves that Israel couldn't, on their own, maintain peace. Israel, on their own, couldn't be perfectly obedient to what God was asking of this nation. Instead, Isaiah points our vision towards another peacemaker. After the exile, the prophet Zechariah wrote this. So Zechariah is a minor prophet who comes at the return of the people back to the Holy Land. He writes this, Rejoice, O people of Zion! Shout in triumph, O people of Jerusalem! Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, yet he is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. I will remove the battle chariots from Israel and the war horse from Jerusalem. I will destroy all the weapons used in battle, and your king will bring peace to the nations. His realm will stretch from sea to sea, and from the Euphrates River to the ends of the earth. Because of the covenant I made with you, sealed with blood, I will, I will free your prisoners from death in a waterless dungeon. Come back to the place of safety, all you prisoners who still have hope. And we see this promised Messiah in Jesus, right? The Savior of the world. At his first coming, Christ brings peace by reconciling us first to God. Colossians 1, for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Romans 5, 1, therefore we have been justified through faith, we read this earlier, and we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Right? However, at the time of Jesus' birth, Jews expected a king who would bring peace by military and political forces. This Messiah, the, the chosen one, would bring peace by establishing his ruling throne on earth, whereby Israel would dwell in safety without the threat of other nations. Rome no longer would have its hold on Israel. This was their expectation. A king on a war horse. But the king comes in a different way than expected. He's born not into a palace, but in a manger. He comes not on a war horse, but on a donkey. He's meek and lowly. He comes not as a ruler, but as a servant. And he's ultimately put to death and never defends himself. Jesus wasn't being passive. He was making peace between us and God by absorbing the cost of our disobedience. Remember, there's a cost to peace. As Paul writes in 2 Corinthians, that God who reconciled to us himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us this, that message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Right? Because of our vertical peace with God, we then have horizontal peace. Peace with each other. 
And by the grace of the Spirit, we're made to be peacemakers. So every time we do that small act of extending the peace of Christ, we're proclaiming that God has made peace with us. And therefore, as a result, we can joyfully give peace to each other. Right, the first Christians did not get the political rule they expected. Everything seems the same. Rome's still ruling. Yet nothing is the same for them. But Jesus promises his spirit, which is his perfect peace, as John 14 says. Jesus says, these things I have spoken to you while I'm still with you. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, I have, um, the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. So church, let, let this, these words of our Savior come over to you right now. Let these words of peace come over you right now. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. As Paul writes to the Philippian church, that the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And so when we live in the tension of the here and now, and as we wait for Christ's second advent, for Christ's second coming, we're not hopeless. We're not hopeless. Right? Because we have a Savior who has made peace with us, even though we are undeserving. And out of that, out of that joy, out of that peace we have with the only person in the universe whose peace counts, we can then have that same peace with one another. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for bringing peace to us. Thank you for not counting our sins against us, but for pay paying for it on the cross. Uh, despite the chaos and the damage that we bring and in the, in the fighting and the violence that we bring into the world and that humanity has brought for all time, Lord, you took that upon yourself. And Jesus, you bore that, you bore the, the punishment of living without, with living without peace. And now you've given us access to a perfect peace that can never be taken away from us. And so, Spirit, by your grace, comfort us as we go about our days, as we continue living in the, the here and now, as we wait for your coming, as, as we wait for the restoration of all things, when you'll bring total peace on earth. Give us grace to wait. And Lord, help us also to be a people that extends this peace to one another for those in this city, Lord. It's a busy time, and a lot of people are in a hurry and are impatient. Help us to be gracious. Help us to be patient. Lord, let us be, as your word says, your ambassadors of peace to one another, especially to those who don't have your light to those who don't have your peace. In Jesus' name we pray.